All right, we are in the time. So it is 12.01 on January 11, 2018. Um, Happy New Year. <laughs> so we do have a quorum. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The Texas flag. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. <laughs> so we have a few items. Uh, the first item on the action items is the consent agenda for the last two meetings. So we receive the minutes via email uh, for the meeting from November 2nd. Do you have any questions about the minutes? Thursday, November the second, two thousand seventeen. That was the special call meeting. I believe. No, the special one. No, the December. Yeah. So, any questions? We don't have any questions. Do we have a motion to approve the November second? I make a motion. We have a second. All in favor of approving the November 2nd meetings? I think. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. We also have the minutes for December 6th meeting, 2017. <coughs> Any questions, comments about those meetings? And that was the session. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Any opposed? Our next item is the request for approval of completed 1617 financial audit. All right. That's me. All right. Thank you. And I'm Darla here with Valdez <laughs> Project. And I'm at the end of getting over laryngitis, so my voice is not able to go in and out. So I apologize in advance for that. But and my husband keeps telling me I should rest my voice, or maybe the way he said it was, can you just be quiet? <laughs> um, I'm going to go over about the three most important pages of the audit, and then after that, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I want to thank Jamie and Christian for the work that they do, give me all the information, because we have a lot of requests for them. And, and they are great to work with. If they were at all my clients, I would not have a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I will second that. you can't see No. If you'll flip with me to page five, this is our opinion page. It's what we consider the most important page out of our audit. You received an unmodified opinion. That is the highest level of assurance that you can receive that there are no material misstatements and that all disclosures have been made in the report. So we're going to flip over and look at your revenue page, which is on page 25. <coughs> and I'll say that school had a really um, good year this year. They got a great job. Um, if you're looking at, we're going to focus in on the general fund column. If you're looking at line 5020, you'll see that total revenues is $4,973,875. <coughs> Total expenditures, $4,724,456. Leaving you a net change in fund balance of $249,419. Leaving you with an ending fund balance of $561,123. So good job on that addition to your fund balance. It's great. We're going to flip over and look at your budget, which is on page 41. On there, where, where we're looking at is on the variances. And so if you'll look at your total expenditure line item of 6030, you'll see you had a positive variance of $221,590. So 
So that's that's basically telling us that the budget that you set forth, uh, the school was able to stay well under what they budgeted. So great job on that. Um, now those are about the three most important pages. Before we leave right here, I'm going to have you flip over and look at page 43. We'll talk, talk about net pension liability, but I just want to point out one percentage, the percentage changes that are happening. If you're looking at that measurement year, that top row where the school's proportionate net pension liability, that is um, that is going to be UT Tyler's um, uh, net pension liability proportional share of the state of Texas. What we have to do to get the school's net pension liability, is we have to take that and then based on the contributions um, uh, to the CRS, we take the school's proportional share to get, and that's how we can come out with the pure portion of that liability for the school. Uh, that liability is, um, it's, it's not a real liability. It's not like you have debt out there that you're paying for. It's, it's based on an actuarial number. The number fluctuates from year to year based on what um, an actuarial is coming up with. So some years you're going to have a positive number change. Some years it's going to be negative. It's just whatever that actuarial is going to come in. It, basically an estimate of what somebody else is coming up with that net pension is going to be. So um, I just, but they, you'll notice this uh, from 2014, 2015, and 2016 on those um, ratios, they've gone up every year and that's based on the growth at UT Tyler. So um, when we come back to the TRS contribution portion, um, since y'all started, uh, the, the academies portion that has increased each year slightly and so we have not adjusted for that increase that proportional share increase but this year we felt like the, that proportional share had jumped because each year y'all have grown so we went ahead and made an adjustment this year and we'll do that until you kind of level out on your grade levels as, as on that part of the growth um, that we'll probably increase that every three years or so when we see that that growth is and therefore we adjust that. So the net pension liability increased for the school this year due to those two things. UT Tyler's portion for TRS net pension liability increased. And then the proportional share of the academy's portion of that also increased because of the growth of both of those. So we're gonna flip back to page 19. <clears throat> so the, the, the pages that we've already talked about, that was the real money that the school has. So the, the numbers based on this page has the, that net pension liability included in that. So I don't want anybody looking at this page and seeing that that bottom total line of total net pension liability of negative 569,000 is a representation of what your fund balance is, because it's not. That is just where somebody that came up with that actuarial number, and we've had to record that because of the GASB 68 rule of recording those net pension liabilities. So I just, I wanted to point that out that everybody saw that page that but everybody understood what that negative number actually represented. And for those of you that have been, while we went through this process, this is the law we got changed so that it did not negatively impact us. Yes. And one of our few legislative successes. Yes, with the first rating. Yes. So, right. And at one time it would hurt us. Yes. And it did not hurt us anymore. Right. Right. And I, I think, and that is based on you are um, a part of the state of Texas. <coughs> And that Texas's pension liability that's out there, and so I think from the big picture of the thing, that agency in the state of Texas saying um, that that first grading or whatever that y'all aren't doing good because you get that net pension liability where it, it's yeah, TA y'all are all underneath the same system. <coughs> Sorry, you know. So that's about the most important pages of the audit. But I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have on that.
we wind up we're just looking at this. I just want to again send a special thanks to um, Jaina and Carrie and um, Christian. These ladies work extremely hard um, on trying to gather all the resources and making sure that they keep track of every single expense throughout the year so then the, that the expenses can be coded correctly. Um, and then working with Darla as well. And so I want to thank your, your firm. Um, for all your support and assistance to make sure that we are in compliance. So um, a, a special thanks there. And uh, I send a shout out to the district at large. I mean, because of this rollover, um, this is because of the efforts of the administrators um, and the efforts of teachers to really look and ask themselves in the curriculum department. Um, to really look and ask themselves, you know, do we do, do we need this or do we already have it? Um, is this something that we can create or can we buy? <coughs> really trying to, to look at funding and look at the way that we spend our money. So this is exciting that we can then all over this amount of money looking at the future. Um, this would help with facility support and things like that. I, I'd like to add, for, especially for the new board members, just that the, um, you may not realize that the all of this is a compilation of uh, you know, Christian having to do with the rule of keeping. Um, we keep folks at the university level, and then we also have to turn around and keep folks at the district level. So when Darla asks us for documentation, it is um, it's not as easy as just writing a report from our school software. I mean, it is reports from university. I mean, even UAN staff, uh, multiple people in your department. We really appreciate Eva and all of them who provide reports to us because there are reports we can't generate because we're not at the university level. So it's their effort as well. Um, but we do keep dual books. So this is not an easy task at all. And we really appreciate Darla being uh, patient with us when we say, we'll get back with you at that point because it's going to take us a little time. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to tell you all, most of the time when I request something, man, I have it just in a couple of minutes. They, they really are on top of everything. We've, we've learned what she wants, so we have it. <laughs> yeah. but, sure. I have a question. We have a question. Uh, well, they were made on the audit side. Yes. Um, right. So the audit reflects any. Yes. 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 So was she talking about asking about this page? Can you yes. Help us understand this page. Um, oh, okay. Just coding um, changes. Or? Well, right. So if I saw something that we needed to code, and some of it had already been made. On their side, but um, the the way that we're having to keep the, the books with the dual system, <coughs> most clients would have a trial balance with assets and liabilities, and so um, sometimes I need to make those journal entries just to show them that we need to have another account set up there. So it, it's really more to help them get um, get that part of it lined out as far as where, where we're trying to move to. The 10,554 and the 19868 have to do with our FSP funds, the amount that the state paid us for the year. And those are settle ups that don't happen until September. Well, the fiscal year is already over, but the money is for 1617. So she has to kind of like, yeah, so on the back. university side is in right. September. So she backs it up into the audit because it's technically for 1617. Yeah, that was kind of weird because on um, one of those, they're giving it to you, and the other one, you're paying it back, and it's from the same agency. And then the 1243, that is basically the cash on hand, essentially, that belongs to the students for their food service. Yes. So when they pay us $20 for their food service, and if they were to leave and had $20 on their balance, we have to pay them their $20, mm -hmm. their $20. So that $1,243 is money that we have in our account that doesn't really belong to us. Right. So we set that up as a due back to your students. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? My my understanding is it looks like we're doing very well. <laughs> yeah, did really well. Well, we get a perfect score. <laughs> no. no management letter comments. We still have not received a first reading from <laughs> our audit that was completed a year ago. Yeah. Because of the new changes of the right. law, so right. not giving. That's exciting. No, that's not me. Yeah. That's TA. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Not our TA has not given us our first reading yet for the prior year for university part. Right. Yes, for the university. Yeah. So the good news is we have um, a strong fund balance. Mm -hmm. Most, most one-eighth of on that one, that's fine. Any other questions, comments? 
you want to say you want to do it this time? Oh, okay. well, you can do it either way. If you want to do it now, I'll take it. Or you can do the time a little bit and scan it in. We'll try to have to take it. That'd be perfect. If you wait for me, we'll get it uploaded to PDF. Okay. Darla, we thank the board. Thanks you for your work and thank your um, guidance through this process. Um, any other questions or comments? We don't. Do we have a motion to approve um, the seven sixteen seventeen financial audit? I'll make that motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank Ms. you. Y'all yeah, yeah, need anything, please feel free to call me. The board members, y'all have okay. questions on anything, please feel free to call me. I feel great. I just can't talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. All right. The only Thanks, Darla. The next uh, item is the approval of the 1718 budget amendments. I'm going to stand up so everybody can see me. Um, on these amendments, all we're doing is receiving some revenue um, in the the local revenue and some C risk salaries that we have for this year. <coughs> and then we're expensing that revenue out and then we're also moving some salaries that we had already had it budgeted. We just need to move it into the correct function that reflect their duties. Any questions? Thank you. Do you have any questions? Do we have a motion? Again, I'll second. I'll second. Who was the first? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Next item is request approval to file waiver for the Texas Virtual School. So we can pull that out because I'm going to talk about it um, later on. Uh, another thing. Okay. okay. So we don't okay. know. Okay. 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 Um, so the next section is the approval of the policy updates. <coughs> and I'm assuming we'll have to approve okay. one each, you know, yes. one each, each and one. Go ahead. Okay. So the, um, the three, four hundred ones, the A, B, and C, I'm going to discuss those um, first. The we technically already approved them in the November meeting, but then they went and made updates at the end of November. So little uh, changes to each of those that you need to basically be knowledgeable of and um, approve. So the uh, 400.080 uh, is the required instruction for graduation. Um, we are, first of all, uh, wanting to remove the section 3.5, uh, which is the post-secondary readiness assessment. Um, that was added into the last one erroneously. We do not um, opt into the Algebra 2 and Algebra 3 EOCs, um, so we're removing that um, because that's not something that the district had chose to do. Um, then Section 4, um, we will administer the preliminary college pre preparation assessments beginning in the spring of 8th grade. Assessment will be used to determine student progress, strengths, and deficiencies, um, and enrollment in dual credit coursework. Basically, that's our TSI. Um, what determines whether the students can begin their dual credit coursework. Uh, section 7 and 8 were both added recently um, due to legislation. 7 basically says that we have to um, provide notice and offer the ASVAB testing, which is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, um, to all 10th, uh, it has to be made available to all 10th and 12th graders. Um, and then we have to, of course, notify them of the date and time and location of where they can take that. Um, and it's my knowledge that we've already started working towards um, having that scheduled for the spring. Um, then section eight basically just goes into detail as to what the school counselor is required to do um, with all um, high school level uh, students and that they receive the following information and then it outlines all of the details of which she needs to have a conference with those students, either like having posting a class or calling them individually. But every high school student has to have these items um, discussed and, and, and provided to them so that they are aware of their options. And, and we have done that. Yeah, she yeah she does that. Yeah. yeah. So now it's just really more her campuses. She works <laughs> with the students, parents are about it. She goes over course offerings. She goes over future plans. She talks to them about what their interest level is as far as what what degree um, pathway they're interested in taking in, in college. Um, so, yeah. Which most of that is already stuff that's been um, defined as the, what a counselor does, but now the state has really 
goes into details of every little piece of information that they have, like a checklist essentially of what they have to be in the mm -hmm. So um, this defines it in writing as to what the counselor is responsible for. Okay. Um, so that's the update on the 480 records. Do you want to go ahead and prove that? Do we have any questions? Do we have a question? Do we have a motion to approve 400.80? <coughs> Second. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Thank you. Okay, the 400.120 uh, is the health uh, policies, and the addition here uh, is basically, you know, the state changed the ruling on lice. Um, it used to be that if a student was found to have lice, the student was sent home. Um, now the student is not sent home um, because they don't want to miss an instruction, but now there are criteria in place to what you have to do um, if you find that you have students with lice and who you have to, you have to notify the parents of the students that are in the class with the um, student who has lice and then send information home to the student with lice as to how to rid themselves of the lice. Um, and so it does include a, a um, template letter that can be sent home as their recommended wording of that. And so that is due to the change in state law that occurred. Yeah. Actually, I believe it went into effect last year, um, if I'm not mistaken, but they're just now getting into it. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of research. We can do it in French, too, when we got on a plane and we were all over head of hair as we walked down and we sprayed us off with something. Uh, <laughs> See, that was... <laughs> it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> But yes, that so that is the only change to the health uh, one is the, the addition about the lights. And our nurse is aware that when so many advanced medicaid goes to someone who works there a lot, and she addresses that with more to the start. Yes. So basically, it just it just gives us the obligation of having to send out certain notifications and meet those um, meet those notification requirements. Mm -hmm. You know there's a parent out there that has yeah. <laughs> <Awesome. laughs> yeah. Any questions? We don't have a any questions. Do we have a motion to approve the health updates? We have a second. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Okay. Student safety. Okay, moving on to 400.140, um, the student safety piece that was added was, uh, actually this was, uh, these have actually already been approved in the prior, not, not the one we just did in November, but when we first approved the 400 module, um, and then when they did the update, they forgot to add it back in, and so all of us essentially took it out because it was out of the um, TEA, or not TEA, the Charter School Association when they made the new model of model updates they took it out and so essentially we're putting it back in um, and so it was technically approved once but then when you reapproved this in november it was missing so now we're just adding it back in and, it's all. and it pertains to um, uh, foster children um, when you have to uh, that the educational decision maker uh, and caseworker of a foster child are notified of very specific events that happen in that child's student's life um, at school and then the truancy prevention and referrals, um, and that we have to have policies in place to what we do with the insurance and referral support assistance, which we do have in place. Any questions? We don't have any questions. Do you have a motion to approve the student safety? Motion. Second. 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 Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Text is open meeting. All right, so moving into 500, these are the government's um, operational type uh, modules. Uh, yeah, government, open government module uh, is the 500. And so the addition here is in section 2.5. Um, this is where they basically talk about the, in what cases you can use video and audio um, conferencing for board meetings. And so since we do have board members who do sometimes have to um, video uh, conference in, this statement is being added. Um, it, it does state that any time a video or audio becomes disconnected, then the board member, member is considered absent. So the video or audio is disconnected. Um, and then it does say that you have to indicate that the video conference will be used uh, on the agenda. Uh, 
each applicable agenda posted prior to the meeting. So we can't just at the last minute do video conferences. We have to make it you know that it will be occurring. Can we just assume it is going to be? Any other questions? Just real quick, you said even if there's a disconnection, the uh, board members can still be on there until they reconnect. Until they reconnect. So if they were to drop off and they never came back on, like they would be able to vote on anything as like as if they're not there. Right. So then all of a sudden you don't have maybe. Well, you don't have say you have have quorum, yeah. 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 Right. Issue. So right. Right. Gotcha. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the 600 module has to do with um, basically HR personnel hiring practices um, is the 0 .060 section. Um, this deals primarily with um, when you're actually hiring uh, employees and you're doing personal uh, background checks. Uh, the additions here, there are several. Um, the new, the biggest piece is the new pre-employment affidavits and the employment <laughs> affidavits. Um, Section 1.3 talks about the pre-employment affidavit. If somebody is applying for a, an educational um, position, like a teacher, a librarian, counselor, anything that would be a certified position, um, that they have to provide a pre-employment affidavit basically stating that they do not have um, uh, allegations of mis, uh, inappropriate contact with students and those types of charges uh, pending. And that if they um, have already gone through all of that, they were determined to be false. So they have to complete that when they're actually applying so that it's basically upfront um, that you know that they're, that they're facing allegations or that they had allegations and they were determined to be false. <laughs> uh, notice it does say that um, if an applicant that answers affirmatively as to having an improper relationship with a minor must disclose all relevant facts regarding the charge, ad, 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 agitation or conviction, and whether the charge was determined to be false. An applicant is not precluded from being employed with UCCIA if the charges were determined to be false. So if they say they were you know, alleged to have and it was determined to be false, you can't just, just you know, throw them away out of the pocket of possible candidates. Um, section three, SPEC reporting requirements. Um, basically, this goes into detail. Um, and this is actually in a couple of sections of the um, policy documents. And it was in one of the previous ones that you adopted as well, where it talks about the principal's reporting requirements if and when they um, allege a teacher has some sort of relationship. Yes. They are immediately required to notify um, SPEC. The superintendent has obligations to notify SPEC. Um, all of those. You know, legal obligations um, to make sure that SPEC is aware that there is a certified teacher in the state of Texas who is basically being um, accused of having a sexual relationship. Um, so basically, this goes into all of that in detail. And then section four pretty much defines what improper relationships are, um, and it goes into electronic communications and when and when they're appropriate and not appropriate. Um, personal phone numbers and emails. Uh, it goes into all of that sort of detail, and then it goes into um, employee reporting. Employees at UTTIA must report any behavior that is observed at school or any school-related school-sponsored activity that might violate policies. And it goes into what needs to be in the report, um, and then of course parent notification when there's an educator who is accused of um, an alleged misconduct. So it just really goes into defining what our obligation is as a school district when that comes to light. <laughs> yeah, dude. Are those affidavits required to be redone or? Oh, yes. Uh, so the pre employment part is that they fill out the affidavit and basically say, This is, you know, the situation here. I don't have anything, or if I've, um, I was alleged to have had and I'm, it was determined to be false, or I'm in the middle of an investigation and it has to be determined. And then if the decision is to hire the person, then they have to complete one that's actually an overness um, that basically says, and that was going to be like a hypothetical, I guess, if, if they were in the process and something was going through. Then my thought would be you probably wouldn't be hiring them until you got an answer. Yeah. Like and then an adjudication would be <coughs> on the next affidavit that is submitted once their contracts are renewed up. Or, 
Um, I don't know if it, it doesn't say that you have to do it every, each it's year. It's when they're initially hired, if that's the initial hiring phase. And then keep in mind that as part of the hiring phase, you have to do <coughs> background checks and fingerprinting. All employees of a school district have to be fingerprinted. And when we go, they get their fingerprints and we go through the system, we pull it up and it pulls up their FBI wrap back as well as the state. And it tells us whether they have any hits and arrests and whatnot, and we make a determination based on that. Um, if there's ever anything on there, we immediately contact Joanne, and she, you know, she makes a decision. Typically, you know, people are clear, there's nothing. Um, and so then they're cleared, and we subscribe to them. And so at that moment, when we subscribe to them, if they were to be arrested in the state of Texas, we would get notification. Yeah. Right now, the rat back for the FBI is a one-time snapshot. <coughs> so if they were to get arrested in Louisiana, across the line, we wouldn't necessarily get immediate notification. <coughs> However, I think it's, we just got an email yesterday, actually, that the new FBI rat back is going into effect here shortly. So then we will start getting the rat back on FBI and do stuff as well. So any, if they are arrested anywhere in the U.S., we would get notified. So. Any other questions? We have a motion to approve. I'll make a motion. <coughs> Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Retirement and good health. All right, so the last one is simply this is a new, um, for the most part, our 600 module, <coughs> especially when it talks about. Um, very specific uh, things like retirement, health benefits, and stuff like that. As the school, we really don't have any control over most of that. It's the university, so we simply say the university supersedes us. So whatever their retirement plan is, their health benefit plan is, that's what we go with. Um, but in this particular section, we have had to add um, the section one about the loss of TRS eligibility, because now the law is that if a person is found and convicted of a felony against the student, that they are basically no longer eligible for their student. Um, so that is a new. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Or any questions? Um, on the first page, it still said name of charter school. On this, on this 140. Yeah. Okay, I will change that. Instead of. Six hundred point forty. On the oh. top, top page. I don't have a 600 point storage. I have the 140. 140. Okay, I'll, 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 find, page. I'll find it. In no, the, no, on the cover page. That's oh, on this page. Yes, it does. You're right. I'm sorry. I will fix that. Yeah, Since we didn't have this technically, they, they've gone through where they've divided it up by policy number so that you can approve individual instead of the whole 600 module, which is kind of nice because now you can just approve the individual sections and so they want this is page for every single section. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any questions any other questions? <coughs> Doug, do we have a motion to approve the retirement authentic changes? All second? Okay, all second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So we that's it for the action items now. Okay. Um, on the 2016-17 Texas Academic Performance Report, an annual item, just to let you know that we did send out an um, email to all the parents letting them know um, how to access it. It is on the, the web font. Um, and so basically it's just an overview of the school and um, it's something that the state um, provides every year and it's required to be published um, and accessible for parents. So they can even, if they don't have access to it, they can come to the office to get a, a printed copy. And this entire packet, the entire annual report um, as uh, compiled, because the TAPR is part of this is a big report, this will be published after the report. It's not published on the website yet. Okay. Um, any questions on that? The board has access to that community, parents, anyone can click on it. So you can go and actually compare, you know, school that's it, if we're in the area you reside in to the Innovation Academy and look at things like that as well. Um, any questions? So a couple items on the superintendent report, financial updates, Chestnut. Um, if you look at your uh, budget here, um, that some of the amendments that you just approved are going to fix some of the things that you see are out of balance on that report. Um, and then I just wanted to make note that I, to give you a more um, 
visual of what our budget looks like, there are some projected expenses on this report. So when the month of December actually closes, there may be a little bit of a variance, but these numbers are pretty close on payroll. All the other expenses are have already posted and all that stuff. Anyone have any questions? So even with this projected um, our annual revenue and annual expenses, we're looking at rolling over some money based on this permit. And just to note, we also put a pretty heavy cushion throughout the budget um, as well. And the reason the, the, the revenues, you know, we get paid monthly, so the revenues will continue to grow even though our expenses exceed our revenue at this point. Um, because the, unfortunately we only get paid monthly, we don't get big chunks. So um, it will it will eventually catch up. <coughs> Any questions, financial questions? Right now we're staying well within our means. Everyone's working hard to do so. So really looking at when we do have an expense, asking ourselves, you know, um, just some basic questions. You know, do we need this? Is this big? does this um, align with our model? You know, even to the point of when we're looking at conferences and things like that, we talked about ways of um, you know, offering conferences to teachers, but trying to encourage teachers maybe that have never gone to a conference to actually start presenting at conferences or submit proposals. A teacher that has gone to the same conference for a couple of years, trying to identify or encourage another teacher to go um, so that we can offer the opportunities for teachers. But the majority of our, our um, expenses comes with um, personnel. <laughs> And it becomes even more difficult with personnel when we start adding to the high school. Just because when you start looking at course options for high school students, um, you have to have a teacher that can teach these specific courses. Um, and these students need a variety of courses, but it might be a small group of students. So you might have one group of students that um, needs the service of like three separate different teachers. Whereas if that was a kindergartner, you, that one teacher could teach those 11 students, but at high school, you might have need three or four different certifications to teach those 11 students for them to graduate. So when you have three teachers to a group of 11 students, it's, the cost um, is, is very heavy when it comes to, you know, trying to school with personnel. So I've always said that your elementary really pays for your high school, your high schools that cost to, to support based on my opinion in review of everything. Um, so, um, any questions on um, the financial updates? All right, so um, the last page is our district campus enrollment and attendance. This is something we've talked about um, on numerous occasions and is ongoing. It doesn't matter how well we can project or help to try to project attendance, it's just, it's just the nature of it. Kids move. Um, you know, we get in situations, especially at the high school level. They start taking good credits. They realize that they're <coughs> struggling with it when we don't have a lot of other options. And so we give them the other option. They don't like the other option. No, I mean, that's our only two options. You either roll in dual credit or you can take the course and don't get the dual credit for the course. You get a high school credit. And then you start running into some hiccups and things. So, um, but. Again, I think that we do an amazing job of trying to support our students, provide them the opportunities um, that, you know, we're just, we're not going to have some of the opportunities that some other schools have, you know, such as the fine arts and the, the sports and things at this point. So, especially when we look at a fifth to a sixth grader, the middle school years and the high school years, there's just a big difference. Um, you know, as a middle school student goes to transition, you can see how our fifth grade from fifth to sixth sometimes, you know, drops. And then into high school. We were talking about um, ways um, today, talking about our first graduating class and talking about ways of, of trying to create more of a culture of, and create those bonds early <coughs> enough and give them a sense of ownership um, through leather jackets and class rings and things like that. So. Um, Trying to look at ways to, to support the retention. Any questions? Um, the next update uh, is um, facilities. Um, again, I think that's going to be on here from from here on out. Um, so we keep talking about facilities and the needs. I think that 
given the situation right now, just to give you an overview. Um, I don't see any really big facility changes here in Tyler. Um, so Tyler will be able to add the 12th grade students next year. Um, speaking of 11th and 12th graders, we met this week um, and we asked if there would be a possibility in the future for our 11th and 12th graders to actually be served at the university. So, you know, 11th and 12th grade students here in Tyler is the reason why we should have to do um, provide facilities for them here when they could actually go and over um, to the university and take face-to-face -face courses. And then there's some options on the other um, uh, district campuses to look at if the teacher was teaching on that campus if those students could take and be housed in um, that facility as well. So as far as here in Tyler, I don't see any really big facility changes. They'll be able to add 12th grade. Um, we had talked about adding pre-K, but we decided to kind of uh, table that until we really get this first graduating class out of the way. Um, we just, as a team, felt like and um, that we were we really need to focus on um, graduating our first class. So um, we look at Longview. Um, you know, right now Longview has um, second through eleventh, so next year they will be at, adding twelfth grade. As right now, I don't see us adding the K-1 in Longview unless we can find out a way to be able to house our 11th and 12th grade students in um, the um, LUC. Oh, then I think some there is some possibility. So in the event that we did not, then maybe if, if you could, if we could house those two grades there, um, then we could look at um, bringing in that K-1. K and I know there is a need. I know the parents want the K-1. They want to finish it out. I mean, we do too. Um, Palestine. Um, Palestine is still up in the air. We met um, this week and talked um, to them in options. And really, there's two options on the table right now. Um, and we have looked at every option that will cost zero dollars to $13 million. Um, and that's just the span of options we've looked at. And so the zero dollar option is to stay put. Um, and that means that students would continue to remain in Mathis Hall, they'd continue to remain outside of Mathis Hall, and we would not add a, we would add a second grade class. So we would roll up these second graders into third grade, the Palestine would just serve third through twelfth grade for the next four years. Uh, that's option, that, that is option one, cost of zero dollars. Option two is to look at, um, get it all finalized here. Option two is to basically look at going in and renovating the um, sewing factory um, that was our current facility um, and when I say renovating it means basically it's very small minor renovations it is um, but the cost doesn't look minor the cost is about nine hundred thousand um, dollars and it looks like it's going to be basically to fix the air conditioning to hire an architect to come in and meet all the compliance and uh, sprinkler system um, to be fire code and then also to look at updating and bringing in additional restroom facilities, so which is a big need there. If, if they could get additional restrooms, um, that would definitely help. So um, in the event we did that, then the option that was presented, again, this is an option that was presented. Um, if we did that, then what we would do is be able to have K through seventh grade inside the sewing factory or the old building. They would then bring the two um, portables up to the sewing factory, up to the school. So those, so each of those portables have two classrooms. So then those students we would house outside of the portables if it wasn't the schedule eight through 10th grade. Um, and maybe she would probably even have to push some of your other classes out as well. Um, and then 11th and 12th graders would be still remaining at this hall. So basically we would be, able, with, this, with this option, we would be able to complete housing K through 12. Bottom line, 11th and 12th graders would be housed in Mathis Hall. The other students would be housed up at the original site with two, um, four classrooms outside. And then they would take that off the back of that, they would add a fence along with a playground for the younger students all at the cost of about $900,000. So um, one thing that we talked about is that we would take $200,000 from our fund balance to put down. The university would then have to loan us the rest of the remaining amount, and then we would have to look at a probably a three to four year payoff. 
um, which is doable, um, but it really ties up our facility funds that we're getting at the district at large. And then also um, we're in two years, the third, the third year, um, the Longview campus will be paid off. And so that, so that will free up that $250,000. And then whatever money we're going <coughs> to the university to pay off housing will be freed up. So hopefully by three to four years, we'll have all the facilities paid for and then we'll start at square one again, trying to decide what to do. Um, again, the cost range that we've looked at has been everything from stay put, zero dollars. I will tell you, I'm not a big fan of the stay put. I'm just speaking frankly with you right now. Um, I think if we stay put, um, we are risking the future of the health innovation path. Yeah, if you stay put, because um, it just doesn't work to have third graders with college students. And um, it's just not a good situation. Um, and um, it's been some pretty tough conversations. So we're trying to do everything we can to say, we'll put $200,000 in. I think that um, with that, we'll be able to move out and we'll just have older students there and so that we can complete our model. Is the university open to that option? I think, as a, I think that after three or four hour meeting um, this week, we felt like when they left, we kind of all took a deep breath saying, we think they're going to buy, I mean, you know. The body language. The body language was good, I should say. That when we said, we'll put $200,000 in, you'll loan us the rest, we'll pay it off in three years, we'll get out of your hair. You know, is it the ideal setting? No, just like they asked me that. I mean, no, I'd love to have a cafeteria. I'd love to have a auditorium. I'd love to have a, a gym. Um, but if you're telling me I can't have those things, then I don't need to bring them back up because all that does is cause a, a problem because then we don't look at the option. We've looked at two other buildings in Palestine, one that was the old Landmark Academy. We went and visited that facility. It's basically the same situation. It's a shell. Now there is a lot more land behind it that could allow for playgrounds and things like that, but they would have to go in and completely um, renovate it. Renovation is costing about $180 a square foot. So to renovate that facility, we're back up into the mix. Um, We've looked at everything from building a, like I said, a new facility. They're they're raising that at about thirteen million dollars, um, and um, it's just it's hard for the university to even think to, to invest thirteen million dollars in a community that has twenty five thousand members. And to put this in context, when the original business plan was written for the relationship, we planned on being a modular building all along. The new administration was not in favor of marching the buildings at all. Okay, so the our plan, it's, yeah, it's kind of blown up. So, so that's the other thing that will come up eventually is they want some sort of facade to kind of hide this campus uh, to, from the street. It doesn't look good. Um, that could change, but I'm just saying down the road that. I mean Tyler here. Yeah, because the, the Longview campus, they didn't. As far as I can tell, they didn't realize it was a modular building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that campus only cost what a couple million. It was hard. a million yeah. plus with the uh, with the uh, with the but all the site work's been done to add behind it. So that mm -hmm. was a cost. Any additional things there? Uh, the minimum. Even yeah, just hooking up electricity to a building. So we'll see. Uh, but it, you know, I like I look at the church over here, the foreign church, painting it the roof blue, the brown <laughs> that's faded. Would make it look more like Ornellis. I mean, I think there are some cosmetic things we can do to improve the appearance. Finishing the bricks. You know, we have buildings for only two sides of brick because that's really kind of the angle to see them from. Uh, I think there are ways to uh, make it better. Some of it may not be to the standard that they want, but it. And I, I think that when we start looking at facilities, and again, I, I want to always speak open to you, I think the university would be more into investing in a facility here in Tyler. Just because of the, the the amount of students that are here, and this is the home campus um, first. So I don't please don't think that they're not open to facilities for Innovation Academy. They're very open. They're, we just have to figure out how we're going to fund them. And so we are looking at options such as um, different options that have been presented to us in the community. So 
um, again, I think right now we just want to protect Palestine and get them out of that situation. Um, so, you know, I really requested for us not to stay put because I really feel deep down that if we do stay yeah, put, then we could actually um, lose, the, lose the eye of Palestine. Um, so any ideas on, on when the decision would be made? So we so. presented it, it's our understanding, we presented all of our information. We had to have our, our spreadsheet updated on yesterday, or day before yesterday, and they were supposed to meet yesterday morning. In fact, it's on my list right now to say, I gave them enough time that I now I can send an email or feel that I can send the email and just say, hey, there was any, any decision made. Because I will tell you, there is a time crunch because the maintenance department said, if we're going to do it, we have to start now if you want us to go skip in there in August. So the good news is they know if they're going to make everyone happy in this situation, I think, as far as, you know, the politics of not having a third grade students in the facility and they know if we're going to bring in K-1, then where are they going to put them? We have to have the school available. Um, I think they know they have to make a decision really quick. So I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks or, you know, by, definitely by the end of the month that we know this is go and this is the route we're going to take and um, we'll move forward with it. Yeah, so we're hoping. Um, any other questions on facilities? And again, that's the overview of all three. I have a question. Um, do you think they would be more open to things here if we, like we, the College of Ed got more involved and like there was more active so, so this is a perception that we need to deal with. <coughs> there were over 40 master's projects done at this campus. This campus. There were over 30 TRES teacher resident students. I'm starting to become paranoid thinking if I do it, it doesn't count. Okay, I am a faculty member. Uh, there are our teachers have all done presentations. We did the Region 7 Service Center yesterday. Our model, we had delegation from Thailand to come and stay here for a week to look at our model. We have been written up. We're the only, according to our coach, uh, Texas PEA STEM coach, the only school of the 20 schools she does that actually meets the model. Yeah, she said that in front of this. And, so we need to do so a better job. We, right? Yes. Uh, we place clinical students here. There are some challenges because right. of, we're small. We, There's we, things going yeah. on. It just... But what we, what we do them. have, there are 100 universities with lab schools. We need to change our language and talk more about being a lab school than we talk about being the innovation academy. Um, in fact, maybe that's what we do, the name change he wants, do it like that. So it, the nurses have a lab, but you know, it's those dummies that you go into their plastic. Well, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have real kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I could have made a great joke, but we're on TV. <laughs> the president wants to change the name. I mean, uh, it has been brought up a couple times now. Sure, I, right here. Yeah. So I haven't heard. I mean, he's he's made that known. That's not a secret. So. Um, so, so I think we should be proactive and come up with a name that shows the relationship better. All the you teach kids come through these campuses because these are the only PBL schools in the area. And that's a statewide. It's actually a national program, and uh, we've just done a horrible job of. A lot of it's my fault, but getting that word out and educating uh, people. And that's, I think that's something you know, we really get to see. Even within our faculty, I don't think people know everything that you just talked about. Yeah, and there have yeah. been some pickups on research that we need to talk about. We can talk about it. Yeah, we talk about and we, we, and I actually presented to the faculty yeah. the last yeah. meeting to say we're open and we actually um, went to a, a meeting there this week or last week and then um, the one of the professors is coming over to do uh, EFL training. So and again, we're one trying thing. to build those relationships. It just takes time. Last year, Kelly, remind me, when Walter and all those people came, we had what, 10, 12 universities here? And the comment when they left was, we're the only university that has a lab school that actually does what we say we do. And he, you don't know Walter Smith, but I mean, in my field, he was huge, okay? Um, and, and so I'm just saying that we, but we've done a horrible job of, and I'll take full blame for that, of getting the word out. We do stuff with engineering, you know? They don't, people don't know about it. We've got to get, we, so anyway, that, some, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there. Um, okay, so just talking about those things, this probably leads into the virtual school. So the virtual school was approved by TEA. 
Um, and we were set to, we have a letter that says we're set to have to open um, in August of 2018. So prior to developing the courses and marketing, we went to get, try to get um, official permission from the university to move forward because this is going to involve a lot of things on their end as well. Um, we were denied permission um, last week to move forward with the virtual school. And um, there was there's a list of reasons, everything from the timeline, you know, you trying to develop all these courses in such a short period of time, um, to everything financially. <coughs> we're not guaranteed the startup grant. I mean, we know that we weren't guaranteed the startup grant when we started Innovation Academy, but you just you just apply for it and you hope to get it. Um, so anyway, to say all that, they have told us that. Um, it's not completely off the table, but they're not giving us permission to start August of 2018. So I have emailed PEA and asked for an extension to start August of 2019. So we feel like that if we get the extension, then we could have enough time, maybe you know, a good year to kind of you know start really looking at some of the things that they identified as concerns. We can address those concerns. Um, and we're we're very um, we're we're, we're disappointed without a doubt um, that we're not able to start, but um, we're not willing to give up at this point. So um, I think there's several people that are willing to join hands and, and try to get, go at it again. So um, I think that the issue here will be if TEA approves us an extension. And so if they do approve the extension, if not, then we would just have to reapply for a, an expansion amendment. So would they want you to develop the courses, like could start working on it so that you have more the, the courses are actually right developed right for the most part. Um, cannot get into the details here, but the the it actually is okay. PEA is kind of in a mess when it comes to yeah. virtual stuff right now. So they might approve the region seven, I mean region ten ran the virtual high school network. Well they pulled that contract. So they don't really have a way to even approve our courses right now. Um, I I know there's leadership changes coming in the College of Arts and Sciences uh, that could be an impact. Um, so but we just feel like a little more time. We need more time. And we can we can uh, move forward because we we still see there's a lot of benefit to it. If we can develop this virtual school, it could it could draw several hundred thousands of dollars that could help build our case for now we have a million or two million dollars down to build a school we'll stay at the university um, loan us the, the rest of the money so um, again I just wanted to bring that up to you um, today that we won't be starting it but again we're trying to get an extension any questions on the virtual school again that, that was just 11th and 12th grade school Not a full complete high school. So as just administrative updates, we are getting ready to kick off our second semester. So I'm um, very excited about that. We will have our first graduating class next year. So right now we are brainstorming everything from a class ring to an invitation um, to um, we're planning our first junior prom that will be held at Holly Tree. So we'll have all three schools come together and. Um, have a, a, a junior prom at Holly Tree. Um, and so I'm real excited about all of the things, but we, we kind of just talked, we have enough on our plate moving forward to get this first graduating um, group um, um, through and complete. We're planning our graduation. We're hoping to have it at the Cowan Center. So all three campuses again will come here. Um, so again, a lot of things that we have to um, plan for for our graduating class, our first graduating class. Lunch program, give you an update about that. We've talked about and we've been in contact with Region 7, so we're just trying to get clarification on if we can have be in the National School Lunch Program breakfast and not be it in lunch, or if we do, if we do away with the lunch breakfast program, then we can, um, we, we still have to provide it, so we don't get reimbursement, but then can, we can offer any type of lunch we want. Um, done my research, the cost on some of the lunches, they're, they're just too expensive. I mean, a parent's not going to pay six, seven, eight dollars for their kid to have a lunch. Um, and so we do have one other option to work with Revolution Foods, who does meet all the guidelines. 
if they are able to service our, our area, they will, we will, we will likely break even if we can get the number down to provide a hot lunch. And so it would be a pay option. You know, that if the student wanted one, or if we did have a student that was free and reduced, we could provide them a free lunch, a hot meal, um, and we would get reimbursed. So um, we're still looking into that. I just wanted to bring that up again because I know that has been brought up in a previous meeting as well as the pre k Any other questions? Do you think, in your opinion, that makes a difference with potential parents bringing their kids here? They offer lunch, they don't offer lunch. I, I don't, you know, in fact, um, the, the directors are welcome to comment on that. They I'm said, curious. you know, that it never even comes up. You know, PTO meetings, um, character lately, the, 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 everything from prom to invitations to things like that have come up. Um, they said it just never comes up. Um, what if we don't, if we can still offer the breakfast program, which we don't think we can, and do a, or do a separate lunch program that doesn't have to meet the national school guidelines, what this would allow the directors to do is maybe once a month or twice a month, they could do some type of like, okay, we can have pizza come in and PTO could sell pizza um, for a dollar slice and you can make money off of that and the kids get a, get some, a hot piece of pizza. Um, same thing with Chick-fil-A. You could come in and come in and, and sell Chick-fil-A sandwiches one day a month. Right now, because we're under the National School Lunch Guidelines, we it, we have been told that it's it's all guidelines. It's, the, it's breakfast, lunch, anything you serve from your snack machines. So we got miss we got two levels of communication. We were told this week that if you buy if you you don't they, each each program is separate, so you can do it for breakfast, and then you don't have to follow the guidelines for lunch. And then we were told, no, that you have to if you buy into it. You, so they are actually calling TEA to get clarification because their Region Seven is actually not on the same page right now. Well, we are on the same page. Is either way, free gets free and reduced gets reduced. Yeah. So whether we're paying for it or we're getting reimbursement from the feds, we still have to provide free and reduced to those who qualify. So if there was a, if we did have a fundraiser and the PTO sold pizza, we wouldn't have to buy those kids pizza, those kids that got free and reduced lunch, we would have to provide them a, a pizza pizza. But a quarter slice. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, unless it was a fundraiser, right? I, I think if, you, if you're looking at it from a fundraiser standpoint of this is available to those who want it over, you know, you would be fine. But the problem you're running into is you're saying this is our lunch for the day and this yeah. is what we, you know, where like if you were having lunch every day, Monday through Friday, and then this happened to be pizza day, oh, and it's going to cost a dollar for you, you would have to provide it for free. If it's a once in a while thing and you're selling it as like a fundraiser tied to something, maybe not. Yeah. But, but does that fall under our, Ms. Dennis, my notes, does that, would that fall under our rotating fundraiser that we did? So that wouldn't count as a fundraiser. That'd be a very long term fundraiser. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Before we dismiss, I just want to say this is um, School Board Appreciation Month and really appreciate all of your service that you provide the Innovation Academy and uh, support. Um, each one of you support your individual campuses in so many different ways um, and the administration and the university staff here supporting the Innovation Academy is truly appreciated. So um, please take your visit to go and um, got cards here from students. Yeah, I heard you Any additional questions before we adjourn? And if you have not signed the sign sheet, oh, I need you to sign. I'm going to send right over here. Sure. I need everybody to sign. I'll second it. All right. <coughs> Thank We're you. Turning it's 105. You did. When did Star open this year for high school? Oh, we'll 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 when? Second week of the month. It's late. I guess they got pushed back to me. So May.